Ginsburg, who talked about native script and view, and we had Keith Tallarico, who talked a bit about his experience trying to integrate view with the Python backend. We had Austin talking about dynamic navigation and view, and then finally John Wen talked a little bit about um, integrating view with Storybook and how you can contribute to open source in the view community. Um, so this is our second speaker, Anna Zanua, and she's going to talk a bit about using view um, for cancer research. And now we're going to have our first speaker, Matt Rothenberg. He is a product designer who works in view, and he's going to talk about view code smells. I have made him smell my code many times. I hear people on the view Discord channel have made him smell their code many times. So let's give a warm round of applause to him. And thank you. this back here. All right, hello everyone. Um, tonight we're gonna talk about view code smells and what you can do about them. So as mentioned, I'm Matt Rothenberg. Uh, I'm a product designer with a code problem, as I like to say. Uh, I've been working with Vue now for about a year and a half. Really, really love the tool. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be here to talk about it with you all. Thanks again to Slice for hosting us and the organizers for uh, creating this venue for us to chat. So some of you might know me again from Discord and Slack where I'm a bit of a loud mouth. Um, I really like to do my community service, as it were, in the Vue ecosystem by answering questions that folks have, giving advice, hearing people out. Um, I can't promise I always give good advice, but I do like to do that, and I'm a firm believer that the best way to sort of learn something is to be able to explain that to someone else, right? If you yourself can't articulate the solution to a problem, perhaps maybe you don't yourself understand it well enough to be giving that advice. So I really like to challenge myself and kind of, you know, hone those skills the best way I can. But in so doing, I have seen some absolutely crazy code out there. I've seen some awesome code to boot, but I wanna talk about the crazy code in particular tonight because I think we as Vue developers can really learn from the ways in which newer developers approach this library and try to solve some of the problems that we're accustomed to solving, maybe with a little bit more facility or a little bit more finesse. And as such, I wanna use the sort of idiom of code smells tonight. And I'm gonna be using it fairly liberally, so please don't lambaste me. I know this is a fairly rigorous and academic thing, but for our intents and purposes, let's use this definition that we have up there on the board. A surface indication that usually corresponds to something deeper, a deeper problem in that system, right? Now, I borrow this definition from this amazing website, which I encourage you all to check out afterwards. I'm sure I'll share the slides where you can grab this link. Um, there's an awesome taxonomy on this website of official code smells um, that really fit into the, the, the paradigm of object-oriented programming. And we're gonna borrow three of these. And again, I'm borrowing them loosely because like, I don't wanna be too academic about this. I think these should be things we use and just small hints we use as we look at code to realize whether it's going in the right direction or perhaps not going in the right direction. And the three that I wanna borrow are these. We have change preventers, first and foremost. Now, change preventers are like what they sound. When you have to make a change, you find yourself hopping from point A to B to C. And you should maybe realize, hmm, if this is a small change, should that be isolated to a particular file, a particular component? Something wrong might be going on. Couplers, you know, we talk about coupling all the time in software engineering, right? You know, we aim for low coupling where we don't keep a tight coupling between entities that might need some level of separation or distinction, right? They can change independently, they can grow independently. And lastly, one of my favorite ones is this concept of inappropriate intimacy, where perhaps one component might be relying on the internal properties, methods, fields of a different component, when in reality they may not have to, or there are different ways to disseminate that knowledge downward or upwards, depending on that hierarchy. And in particular, I wanna talk about three particular code smells that I see all the time in my daily job on the Vue Discord and the Vue NYC Slack channel. Although I don't see as much of it on the Vue NYC Slack channel, so good job, Tessa. Um, the three we're gonna talk about are what I've affectionately dubbed the parent trap. Uh, the second one is event catapulting, which you might think is a counter to prop drilling if you're familiar with React and prop drilling that happens there, and does not compute. Um, one big caveat to all this, if you're sitting in here as an advanced view developer and you look at this code going like, oh, I would never do that. Pat yourself on the back, be happy. Maybe you can pass along this knowledge to someone else who doesn't have that facility with the framework. Um, I do think there's value in talking about this, but some of these examples might smack you in the face and go like, why would I ever do that? But believe me, I see this day in and day out on that Discord. So there are people who are not grokking what we, I think, grok and maybe take for granted as view developers. So let's talk about the parent trap. Can you all see that code? Um, Raise of hands if you, if you can't see it. Okay, I wonder if we can like 
Anything we can do to bump up the brightness or contrast? Yeah, let's do that real quick. Oh, cool, they can see it over there, nice. So I can get, get to talking about that. The, the parent trap sort of rears its ugly head like this, where on the left we have a code sample that I've dubbed the bad code sample, where in a child component, someone has done this.items equals this.$parent.items. Now, I see this day in and day out. There seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding about how information can disseminate from a parent to a child. Now, if you're looking at this and going, oh my gosh, use props, you're 100% right. Props are indeed the preferred way of communicating information downwards from a parent to a child. And yet, folks don't grok this and tend to rely on the fields that are available on the this object when they're inside of a method or they're inside of a lifecycle hook like you have here. And I think they're better suited taking a step back and asking themselves, what are the canonical ways of which I can solve this problem? And in this case, we have props. Cool. So the parent trap also rears its ugly head in this way, where let's say we have a child component that wants to trigger a focus method on a parent input. Better, worse? Worse, yeah. Yeah, we already said that. What if I use like my cell phone flashlight? <laughs> Better, let's do it. So let's say you have a parent component that has an input in it, and when something happens in the child, you wanna trigger a focus on that parent. Well, the, the newbie view developer might say, oh, that's easy, I'm gonna use this.parent, which exposes to me all the references that are defined on its parent via .refs. I'm gonna use the one that's named input, and I'm gonna call the focus method on it. And the enterprising smart view developer goes, no, 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 that's silly. What I'm gonna do is, from the child component, I'm gonna emit an event called focus. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because this now frees the child component from being tightly coupled to the parent. It doesn't have to know what refs are defined in that parent component. It doesn't have to know if there are any inputs at all in that parent component. It sends an event upward, and that is all it needs to do. And what happens is, on the parent side, the parent just has to say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna catch that focus method, and I'm gonna register some kind of handler to take care of it. And we can move that logic upwards inside of that handle focus method and we've now decoupled this parent and the child, and they can live independently while achieving the same behavior that the de developer sought out to implement. The thesis that I like to sum it up as is data down, events up, right? This diagram is straight from the view documentation, which I encourage everyone to read. It's really, really good. But the thesis is that parents pass down properties to child, to child components, that is it. Child components simply emit events back up that tell the parent what to do, that's extremely right. Um, and the reason we do that is because it keeps things super predictable and easy to reason about. You don't have to look inside of a child component to figure out what's happening in a parent component somewhere later in the life cycle of your application. It also encourages your components to be reusable and that again, they're not tightly coupled to the parents. And it keeps components pure, right? You can think of them as functions. A component takes a prop and it renders a thing at the end of the day. You no longer have to guess what side effects might happen along the way. It just takes A and returns B. Now, when I get confused and you know, I'm doing some view stuff, I always like to keep little quotes or tweets or things nearby to sort of remind me the, the right way or the better way of uh, accomplishing problems. And I really, really love this tweet from Eric Elliott and he says, quote, life is simpler when UI components are unaware of network, business logic, or app state. Given same props, always render same data. I encourage you when you're stuck, just kind of take a step back, maybe look at one of these quotes and I promise you'll likely net out in a better place than you were before. Cool, so we talked about the parent trap, right? But the thing is, the parent trap is fairly simple to avoid, but when we start talking about cross-channel communication or cross-component communication, I should say, people start to do some insane stuff. Like we have my French comrade here, Mass, who asks me, and I know this is in French, I'll translate, he basically asks, is there a different solution besides view for doing this.parent.parent.parent.emit? I know it's really not that pretty. And I had to tell Mr. Mass that, you know, I think Vuex is your solution, and I wanna show you here how people get confused about cross-component communication and start doing some baddie, spaghetti-type code to solve that problem. The code ends up looking like this, almost nine out of 10 times, where you have a child component at the top of the screen here, right? It's gonna emit an event called do something, right? Keep it very simple. The objective of this code sample is to get that event all the way up to the parent. But when you're using Vue's native event system, you have to thread that event up every single layer of your component hierarchy, which means that if you have a parent, it goes there. If you have a grandparent, it goes there. And finally, when you have a grandparent, it gets up there, where you can finally trigger the method, give up, or whatever it happens to be, right? 
And that's fine, right? But what you do is you introduce this thing called event catapulting, and it doesn't always end up well, right? Like you don't always solve the problem at first blush, or it takes you a few tries to realize like, I'm just triggering an event from a child. Why doesn't it bubble up? This is hysterical. I watched this like a million times before I put it in the slideshow, right? And one of the common solutions proposed to this problem is the view event bus. And I'm gonna take a hard stand tonight, and I know this might be controversial. I don't think the view event bus is the solution to this problem. I think it creates more problems than you need, and I think you should be using Vuex. And I'm gonna hand wave that away, but I'm actually gonna go and explain why I think Vuex is a better solution to that problem, and perhaps in Q&A we can talk about maybe the more nitty gritty about that, or even after the meetup. So why Vuex, right? Well, first and foremost, it's just easier to work with. It's a pattern. There's an established DevTools extension for Vuex, so you have first class debugging. You can travel in time and see how mutations affected your state over time. More importantly, it decouples your components because now they're not aware of that component hierarchy that lives above them. They simply send events in the hopes that somewhere down the road, data comes streaming back down through the tree and they get a new crop and they re-render. Everyone's happy, right? Modules and namespacing. With the event bus, you have to create as many event buses as you need to well compartmentalize the data that you're transmitting across your application. The Vuex metaphor has modules where you can say, I want this module to handle this bit of business logic, and Vue gives you first class support for dispatching actions to, the, to those modules and mutating the state of that module. Um, and again, the dev tool support is really, really stellar. It's an awesome way to develop. You never feel like you're lost. You can always see what's happening at any given point in time. Can't recommend it enough. Please do not use the event bus. Please use Vuex. If you're having trouble, I'm happy to help. I just think the event bus causes far more pain than it is worth. Okay, the last sort of code smell that I wanna dive into here is called does not compute. Now, I know this is a long snippet. Feel free to read it, but I can kind of summarize it here. One of these scenarios happens daily on the Vue Discord where someone has a component, say it's a parent component, and they're doing a V4 because they have a list of things that they wanna iterate over. And inside of that list of things, they wanna do something like conditionally render one of them or dynamically assign a reference to one of those items in that V4. Or maybe, you know, compute a URL that a, that, that a link has, like user slash four, where four is interpolated from the link, right? The thing is, people are fundamentally confused from what I've seen about what methods are and what computed properties are. And the sort of thought process that materializes as a function of this confusion looks like this. First pass at the problem. We have a V4 expression where one is iterating over the items that they have in a list, and they simply use inline logic in their template to solve this problem. They shove a VIF in their template and they say, crazy expression. This is taken straight from Discord, by the way. Don't think that I invented this. If the route is something and the ID is two, show it. If not, I guess, do something else. When you tell them, yeah, you know, well, template logic is not great. You should probably take that out, make it a method or a computer property. They're like, okay, I'll make a method. And the method tends to look like this. They take all that logic from that inline uh, logic from before, they shove it into a method on the parent component, and they find that they have to pass the argument that they're iterating over to actually make this achieve the problem they wanna solve. And you might be thinking like, what's wrong with this? This is totally fine. And I will concede, this is totally fine code. But I promise you there is a better way to solve this problem and one that is more canonically view and that I think people tend to perhaps overlook when they're designing out their components. And the more canonically view way of solving this is again, to create a component, pass down the item as a prop, and use a computed property to determine whether or not to render that thing, right? So here now, notice that should show no longer takes an item as an argument, as a method. It becomes a computed property, and we can inflect, we can say, hey, if this.route.name is whatever, and this.item.id is two, go ahead and show the thing. To me, this is far easier to reason about. A parent isn't responsible for figuring out how a child component should render a thing. It just creates a nice division of labor, and I think at the end of the day, it creates a cleaner code base and one that anybody on your team can reason about a bit easier than if you're just adding tens to dozens of whatever many methods and a parent component to solve that problem. And you'll see that this doesn't just creep up again in that example for conditional rendering. It creeps up when you're doing things like dynamic image paths or dynamic links for a particular element. So on the left, for instance, we have a list of to-dos, let's say, right? And to create a dynamic ref for those to-dos for some later DOM manipulation that you plan on doing, you create a method, you pass the index to that method, and you get an automagical to-do dash number of the index back, cool. Same thing on the right. Let's say you wanna use a view router to dynamically generate routes for a list of users. 
you'll use a method to go ahead and shove the ID against slash user slash ID. And same thing for an avatar URL, right? You slam images slash user slash name, where name happens to be the path of, a, of an image, right? And again, I think this is a huge violation of this idea that parents should not be responsible for figuring out how child components render themselves. Where possible, let's create components that take that data as props and figure out on their own accord how they should render on the page. So how might this look in a computed property in type of implementation? Well, if we were to take the markup from before, let's create a child component, call it user, let's pass down user as a prop, and let's use computed properties again to return what those derived values happen to be, user route or avatar URL. So again, this happens daily. I constantly find myself saying like, is a computed property, computed property better here than a method? And people finally realize that by pushing this down to a component, it actually helps out with the cleanliness of their code quite a bit. Now I lied because today I saw something on Discord that I wanted to share. I told you I only had three code smells, but I had to tell you this one. Somebody came on Discord saying, I want to implement this in Vue. And I was like, all right, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I got a lot of animation going on there, but like, cool, let's do it. And the initial implementation for that was what I would call wildly imperative, insofar as the developer was trying to tell Vue, hey, I want you to do this to the DOM. I will tell you exactly how this animation should work. I will tell you exactly what HTML should render. I want you to figure it out. But they were going about it the wrong way. So you'll notice here, they use a method on their component to literally generate HTML. And while this might actually work at the end of the day, I would say this is canonically against the style of view that is far more declarative where we tend to let our data and our underlying data model decide how the DOM should behave, act, look, et cetera, right? So when you have this imperative implementation where you're using methods to just slam HTML into the DOM like that, take a step back and ask yourself, is there a more declarative way of doing this? And when you look at this code for a while, you start to think like, okay, I'm seeing what's dynamic. You know, they're passing a sentence to a function. They're passing some kind of interval. That looks cool, right? And you can flip this on its head and instead create a component that can be reusable. You can apply this transition to whatever you want. All you have to do is sort of rejigger it and create a data model that allows you to compute those different properties, right? So assuming we have a sentence, we can create a computed property that splits that sentence apart, returns each letter of that sentence as an element, right? And we can compute a style property for each <coughs> pass of that loop that corresponds to some logic we want to do to create that kind of like wavy effect, right? But we're doing this in a way that's testable, that's declarative, where our data model decides what happens and we don't tell the DOM, animate this, toggle this, fade this, apply this style. We let our data inform that. It's a common mistake, but again, I think with Vue, we really are encouraged to think declaratively and again, ask ourselves how the data might help us solve the problem at hand. And again, you know, I really like these quotes. You know, some of them can be pithy or trite, but I think uh, they're really helpful reminders when you're stuck on a problem of how to maybe think differently about something. So Guillermo Rauch is fairly ubiquitous in the JavaScript community, does a lot of amazing work. He wrote a blog post in 2015 that's just mind-blowing. It's called Pure UI. And he asked us to think about how with a declarative data model, right, we can be relieved of this need to sort of, you know, tell the DOM what to do, to think back to using jQuery, to toggle this class, add this class, hide this thing, and instead just tell Vue or React or whatever library you're using, I want thing to look like this in state A, I want thing to look like that in state B, let the library figure out what that in-between looks like and solve that transitional problem for you. So again, a super helpful quote, I encourage you to read this article as well. I think it'll have amazing uh, positive impacts on the way you write code in general, but also view code. And just to kind of sum this up, this brief talk, you know, we can start out with code that's smelly and garbage on the left, but with a little bit of work and just taking a step back and asking, is there a better way of doing this? I think we can end up with one of these beautiful Le Labo candles on the right, which cost a lot of money and I wish I had, but I don't have any, but smell really, really good. So yeah, that's all I got for you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Questions?
Right, it's a great question. So to reiterate, right, why wouldn't someone just instead set up their data in such a way that you could compute or derive the value of whether or not it should show from the data model itself? And I think that's a fantastic question. And it speaks to this idea that with a view component, there's more than one way to solve this problem, right? So to your point, that's an absolutely viable situation. Let's create our data model. Let's refactor items, maybe create a computed property on it that adds a Boolean field on each iteration of that loop that we use to in determine whether or not it should render, right? I think that's just as valid as instead of ripping this out to child components. I guess the question I would ask is, do you envision yourself using this blob of markup that you have here between the UL in other places? Is this a reusable component? That might be the indicator that you should really refrain from doing that, instead push that computed logic down a level into the child component. But to your point, it's an awesome solution to the same problem that you saw with a uh, child component and computed property. Yep. Yep. Cheers. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you.
big fan of you and a big fan of Evan. Evan, I don't know if you're watching, but her secret wish is to take a photo with you someday. She uses you at Mount Sinai to create cancer research tools, and today she's going to be sharing with you her latest project. So let's please give a warm round of applause to Anna. frustrated that Matt's was so good because now I'm like, <sighs> um, just to be totally clear, I'm not a view expert at all. I'm not going to be talking that much about view itself, this framework. Um, I'm mostly talking about a project that I built with view, but I do promise a lot of view based puns, starting with this photo of my dog, whose name is Hugo, but tonight we'll find what if a patient's genetic mutation profile doesn't include any of the major cancer pathway genes? Are you stuck? Are you at a loss? Do you not have a, a target for them anymore? And the answer is, or that leads to the argument for network analysis, or more specifically, an argument for combining network and pathway analysis. So let's say, for example, you have patient A, and the genes in the patient's profile aren't in any sort of cancer pathway, and you sort of feel at a loss. However, when you look at this entire network of genetic interactions, you can see that the list of mutated genes, here marked in red, can actually be themselves sort of peripherally but directly related to cancer pathway genes when you look at them in gene networks. And that's what this tool network assessor does. When patients' agenetic mutation profile ends up being significantly related to the MAP kinase pathway that we were looking at earlier. So network assessor allows you to view a particular genetic profile or list of genes relationship to 30 like sort of uh, per expertly curated ca major cancer pathways. Um, and we decide which, which pathways are the most significantly related to this particular tumor profile based on a statistical analysis that I think was going a little bit into the weeds here. Um, but this is sort of a, an image of what that looks like, and you can see that MAP kinase signaling has a pretty significant relationship to this particular tumor profile. Um, so now it's a, a screen cap demo. It's a complicated idea, but a simple tool. So I spent all this like hubbub telling you all about the science behind it and sort of the research, but the tool itself, the screen cap will take like one minute. <laughs> and it was built with Vue.js. Um, so here we go. Um, you can find this on networkassessor.net if you yourself are a cancer researcher. Um, we'll take in a list of genes. So for example, let's say these are genes that are overexpressed in particular patients. Um, you can see that these are the major cancer pathways, and in particular, they're ranked based on the significance of which are the most, um, sort of most uh, prominent cancer pathways that are related to these genes. Um, the rankings and this computed properties, might as well throw some view in, in there. Um, okay, and then you can sort of change the colors so that you can visualize properly. Um, you can see different degrees of separation between the cancer genes and the particular genes in this, um, in this individual's cancer profile. Um, yeah, there was, you know, it's, it's responsive, it's reactive. Um, you can view lots of different sort of, if you wanted to start getting into the weeds in terms of what genes are actually interacting with the genes that are possibly leading to this person's cancer. And then you can change and toggle between different databases. Um, oh, that's just like a, hi, like this is view responding. Um, okay, cool. So now, I wanted to make this last bonus argument since we are at a Vue.js meetup to say that view are beautiful, or rather view are beautiful. Somebody brought that up earlier. Um, this is my, so this, this particular tool has actually been in development for a really long time. And this is my predecessor's site, um, and it took him two years to build this. But I started using Vue right from the outset, and I decided to just build it, rebuild it from scratch, and it took me closer to six months. And I think that it really helps to have such an organized framework. This was built with jQuery, and it doesn't even have as many features. And I think it helps to have like an organized framework and this sort of really comprehensive ecosystem um, to just like get things out there fast and get them working and to make them sort of, I don't know, good. Um, I just complimented my own site. Um, but then here are the components that I, I like use and I'm so grateful to them and that's another cool thing about Vue and that, like that's what makes me feel good about sort of this community and this ecosystem. Um, I use Vue swatches to be able to uh, 
visualize the different pathway and genetic profile genes. I use VDRAG Global Resizable so that you can have a legend. Um, I use VUX and view local storage. And I just, um, I'm very grateful to all of you. I'm very grateful to as many years. So if you want to take a photo with me, um, you can. And then finally, the real thank you very much. Um, you can, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And finally, the real reason that I'm here is that my husband is here um, and we have an Instagram. He's also a developer where we both code. And so you can follow us at care underscore programming. Thank you. Features that I didn't show. Um, I honestly I thought that this meetup was on Friday, so I didn't really have a whole lot of time to get the screen shot together. Um, it's on Views Day. What's that? Oh, it's on Views Day. Oh snap! Of course. Um, <laughs> I was so confused. Um, <laughs> so yeah, those are features. So for example, users can upload their own pathways uh, rather than just the canonical pathways, and then you can. If I want to compare like this set of genes that I think might actually influence the tumor profile, how can I, I you can add those and see. Um, yeah, there are other features where users can also in, upload their own like network network interactions, their own gene networks. Um, yeah, and then like there are ultimate features you'd like to add also. So for example, a, a filtering process for the genes because sometimes this is, I gave you like a very small sort of sample, but in general, you'll get like huge lists of genes and it helps a lot to be able to filter them based on what you think is most important. Um, so to, uh, to add like sort of a filtering method before you go to the network visualization, that's, that's the idea. Okay. Yeah, what are, what are your tips for beginners or what do you wish that you knew, you, when you started? Oh yeah. Um, I've used some really great um, tutorials, uh, namely the one on, was it Lara? Bucast? Yeah, Bucast. Yeah, that's really great. I highly recommend that. Um, and I guess just like, don't use jQuery with Neo, because I did that, and then I realized, like, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, I thought the whole point of this is that my dom is reacting. I don't need to like go in and grab it and reach stuff. Um, and it's very easy to just like try to, to use jQuery to like solve a problem um, because it's I don't know it's intuitive. It's it's sort of it's like it's like a nice big hammer, you know. Um, but I I would recommend trying to avoid it if you can. I think that. Um, oh and uh, oh never mind. <laughs> Yeah. But that, well, this isn't actually view related, but I really like the Airbnb style guide for writing JavaScript. Because I, I work on a team of one, 
so it's nice to have something remind me, like somebody's gonna have to read this at some point, and here's like a good way to write so that maybe some imaginative person reading this can read it later. Um, 